is great to see everybody here today. You guys excited that you're in church today? Anybody? Anybody excited? Not bad. Not bad. Happy Thanksgiving. The turkey coma has worn off, it sounds like. Great job. Great job. Hey, we are in part five of our six-week series, It's Complicated. We've been asking the question over and over and over during these last several weeks. Well, what's complicated? We know life is complex. Relationships are complex. Marriage is complex. Family is complex. And I think one of the things that's been really encouraging as we've been studying verse by verse through the letter in Ephesians is that it doesn't have to be if we follow God's plan. And we're going to jump into a section of scripture here this morning that is, I think is actually a really important conversation. And Paul gives us some specific ways to walk this out. But I'm actually going to step aside this morning because I want the master to come up. Today, Pastor Bruce is bringing the word. It's been a few weeks. Give it up for Pastor Bruce, everybody. (laughs) Thank you. I love you. (laughs) Oh, and you know what? Just to set the record straight, he did not schnooker me into this. I asked, which, (laughs) you know, what a dodo. Last month was my birthday, and uh, about one month ago, and my mother called on my birthday and sang happy birthday. I mean, it was was, uh, very cute, beautiful, and special. And uh, 93 years old, living on her own, and she told me a story uh, the story about what happened the day I was born. And so I'm <clears throat> doing this just to break the ice. <laughs> um, she tells me this story, and parts of it I've never heard before. Uh, Mom was in pain, expecting a baby, her first, me, and... Dad drives her to the hospital. If, if you've ever seen the hospital in Shano, there are great, big, beautiful white pine trees in the front. My mom got out of the car and walked smack dab into a great, big uh, white pine tree. She didn't fall over, but uh, I guess she hugged it, and that explains why I love trees to this day. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, she got in then, met the nurse. She was moaning in pain, and the nurse said to her, Mrs. Calise, you may not have that baby for two days, and which made her almost fall over dead. Um, and so uh, just then the doctor walked in because my grandmother called the doctor. The doctor was Dr. Cantwell, and he had taken my dad to a father-son banquet because... My, my dad's dad left for the West Coast, and, uh, and he said to the nurse, have you checked Mrs. Calise over? And she, well, not yet, not yet. And uh, so she set, laid mom down, uh, started checking her over, and this is a quote, a direct quote from, <laughs> from the nurse that my mother gave me. Oh, my God, the child is coming. (laughs) (laughs) Ta-da! You know? And, uh, boy, I guess that nurse got um, a talking to from the the doctor about getting getting people ready right away and checking them over. So, you know you have been around a long time when they're naming hospitals after the doctor who delivered you. (laughs) And uh, that's sort of the case with my mother. Dr. Bellin delivered her, and the big hospital in Green Bay, Wisconsin, is Bellin Hospital. And um, the Cantwell Peterson Clinic in Shano, and that's, that's where, uh, where I was born. Well, last week, Pastor Jim uh, covered the previous verses in which Paul explains how Christians are to live out their faith. And 
rather than imitating the world and rather than being controlled by worldly things, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's, that's one of the last portions of Scripture from last week. Uh, let me read that, beginning with Ephesians 5, verse 18. Uh, and this won't be up on the board. But do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Um, that's, that's what we're to be doing. But Paul continues in this same vein of being filled with the, the Holy Spirit. How can you know that you are filled with the Spirit. Well, verse 21 is where I'm going to begin, and this is one way to know if you are filled with the Spirit. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm telling you, COVID brings out the worst in a lot of people. And there are a lot of people who... I would say, maybe know better, but choose not to submit to anybody. And uh, the, the very word submission makes us recoil. We do not naturally submit in any realm of our life. And that is because submission is a supernatural work of God. That's what it takes. It takes a supernatural work of God in our lives to allow us to submit. And I am talking this morning about mutual submission. I ask for this subject. Um, I, I, have, I have a friend who called me uh, from Oklahoma, uh, Bill Gilligan. We, we were youth pastors together in Ohio many, many back in the antediluvial period when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And, uh, and he said, um, so are, are you preaching anymore? I said, I'm preaching this Sunday. He said, what are you preaching on? I said, I'm preaching on the headship of the man and the submission of the woman. And he said, I would suggest <laughs> parking your car very near the rear exit, and as soon as the sermon is done, don't go shake hands, bug out. And so that's what I'm going to do. If you have any questions about this message, direct them to Pastor Jim, Pastor Jim, who's sitting over here. So let's look at the term uh, mutual submission. What on earth does it mean? Because verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submission in the context of a Christian relationship includes the idea of putting someone else and their needs above our own needs. And this is not for personal benefit, but rather out of respect for Christ. And when we are able to do this, put others above our, ourselves, out of respect for Jesus Christ, when we are able to do this, it becomes a powerful witness to the world of who we are and what Jesus has done in our hearts. This approach stands in stark contrast, mutual submission, stands in stark contrast to the worldly wisdom for instance, in business, um, the principle is often taught to either put ourselves first or to help others so that they can benefit us. Help all the peons on the lower part of the uh, pyramid chain so that more money can gush our way. Uh, that's, that's a kind of a cynical way to put it. But Paul offers a better 
and higher way. He says that putting others first is really service to our Lord Jesus Christ. And the the New Testament says, in fact, that giving a cup of cold water to someone is service to Jesus. Visiting someone in prison is service to Jesus. And this this is what Paul is asking us to do. This is an important principle in the church. It is an important principle in the workplace. And it is an important principle in the context of marriage. So we're going to be talking specifically about in the context of marriage. But if you're not married, guess what? It still relates to us. We are, it, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, married or not married. Mutual submission is an important part of following the example that Jesus Christ set, who submitted himself willingly to the will of his Father and gave himself a sacrifice for us so that we could be saved. Listen to Philippians, the second chapter. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, and taking upon himself the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So it is no, thank you. (laughs) Is she sweet? Honestly, next to Jesus Christ in my life, she is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I say that now because I'm going to give her a little zinger later on. (laughs) It is no accident that Paul uses the family as a measure of being filled with the Spirit. If Christianity does not work in the home, we should not export it. That is a good word. Thank you. Now comes the hard part. (laughs) After verse 21, which says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22 says this, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband, who, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. This would be a very inappropriate time for me to look down at my wife and say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. (laughs) I got chewed out for saying that one time. Oh boy, I owe many of these principles in this sermon about the family to Dr. Howard Hendricks. And he taught at Dallas Theological Seminary during the 60s and 70s. And uh, I would recommend, highly recommend anything that he has written. And I have used his material. So point number one, What does the term mutual submission mean? Point number two, what does it mean for a wife to submit to her husband? Can I suggest two things 
that it does not mean? If I were teaching this on a Wednesday night, I might have six, five or six or seven things that it does not mean. But for time's sake, let me just go over two of them. Number one, submission does not mean inferiority. I constantly meet people, men and women, who think somehow submission has an element of inferiority in it. And I think 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 11, chapter 11, verse number 3, brother, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, deals a death blow to that whole concept. It says, the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. If you ever even think that a woman, by willingly submitting herself to her husband's leadership, is taking a place of inferiority, then by the same logic, you are trapped because you are also saying that Jesus Christ, who willingly submitted himself to the headship of his father, was therefore inferior to his father. And that, my friends, is out and out heresy. And it is just as unbiblical to ever entertain a shred of thought concerning the inferiority of a wife. I think we need to do an awful lot of thinking in this area because when you even mention the subject of submission, you immediately get a reaction as if submission were the exclusive responsibility of the woman. Listen, submission is the lifestyle of the believer. And I didn't invent this. God did. And, I, and you show me someone who can't submit and I'll, where God tells them to, and I'll show you somebody who can't submit to God either. And as Pastor Jim said, Going verse by verse through a portion of scripture, you cover all kinds of subjects that could easily be skipped over, you know. And um, so that, that is one of the reasons we love just going through a book. And subjects like this come up. You can't get out of it. And number two, submission does not mean that you are committing intellectual suicide. <laughs> a woman might say just off the top of her head, if I have to submit to my husband and everything, I'd first have to commit intellectual suicide. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we know how you feel <laughs> as men. <laughs> but on the contrary, au contraire, what you'd really do is commit yourself to God. And that is the most intelligent thing that you could ever possibly do. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husband as to the Lord. I am convinced that we have emphasized submission to the husband and underemphasized submission to the Lord. For Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should, should submit to their husbands in everything. But let me ask, when we submit ourselves to Christ, Jesus Christ, as members of his church, are we committing intellectual suicide? On the contrary. It, that may be the first time that we ever learn to think the actual thoughts of God when we commit ourselves to him. It's the first time we get real intellectual perspective. It is not suicide to commit to submit yourself to Jesus Christ and his will. It is the 
only way to satisfaction. So let me read on as I've dug myself in a real hole with women. <laughs> let me dig myself in a hole with men now. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. What does it mean when Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Men, Paul says, in effect, if you want to evaluate if you are under the control of the Holy Spirit or not, don't look at your profession don't even look at your ministry at church. Look at your marriage. In these verses, Paul sets forth a twofold thrust of this argument. Number one, the husband's scriptural position is that of a leader. And we've just gone through some of those verses, 22 through 24. But the husband's supreme passion is that of a lover. And, or it should be. And that's verses 25 through 29. If you have one leadership without love or love without leadership, if you have one without the other, you have distortion. And the great need is for balance. His position, one of leadership. His passion, one of love. Husbands, your leadership should be a leadership of love just like that of Jesus Christ. If you have leadership without love, you have dictatorship, which is repugnant. If you have love without leadership, all you have is sentimentality. There must be a balance of both of them, leadership and love, in order to have what Jesus had, a leadership of love. When you even mention the subject of the husband is the head of the home, several erroneous concepts automatically surface none of which are supported in Scripture. So allow me to blast away at four of them. If I was teaching this on a Wednesday night, I'd blast away at more of them. But number one, headship is not dictatorship. This passage provides no warrant for an autocratic rule. Ephesians 5.23 says the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is also the head of the church. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ is not in the process of cramming anything down any of our throats. Even though he is Lord, even though he is the sovereign with total rights to our lives, he is not in the process of exercising an autocratic rule in our life as a member of his church. And no husband has any scriptural support for that kind of rule in the home. Number two, it is not the man, headship does not mean the man is making all the decisions. It doesn't mean that there's not plenty of room for discussion and plenty of room for delegation. We know this by the pattern 
that Jesus Christ himself set. As head of the church, he has delegated to us fantastic responsibilities, awesome responsibilities that makes us want to drop over dead just listening to them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every person, making converts and baptizing them in the name of the Father. Does that sound like he has given no responsibility to us or stupid, meaningless responsibilities? No. And how ridiculous for us as men to make decisions in areas where our wives are authorities and we have no competency whatsoever. That would completely bypass the fact that Jesus has given our wives gifts, wisdom, and insight. And to bypass all of that is also to throw out the window the value of the one flesh relationship. And you don't have to live too long to realize that it is the greater part of wisdom to discuss a lot with your wife before a decision is made. She's got gems of wisdom to add. And some men could at this point break out into a cold sweat when they think of the stupid decisions they have made. They discuss and discuss and get the facts out there and finally say, I feel led by the Lord. <laughs> One week later, it was obviously a stupid decision. He knows he's done it. You as the wife knows he's done it. So just pinch him if he's sitting by you. Go right ahead. You have, you have my permission. <laughs> and ladies, when this happens, here's how to solve it. Here's what you need to say, ladies. Honey, I told you so. <laughs> if you had just listened to me, we would have never gotten into this big pile of trouble. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, that'll help your marriage like to no end at all. So if you're sitting there and you know she's done that and your wife knows she's done it, go ahead, pinch her. Just make sure it's your wife you're pinching. <laughs> but how wonderful for the, for the husband to come to the place of humility and say, honey, I really blew that one. And then to have an understanding wife who says, that's okay, honey. We'll start over again from here. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> one lady said this, honestly, my husband is the head of the home, but I'm the neck that turns the head. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're not talking about that either, okay? <laughs> And I know what you're wondering. You're wondering what happens when you have opposing viewpoints and there's been discussion and all the facts are laying out there and you've got to make a decision and you don't agree. In those instances, a decision has to be made. You can't paralyze the family because of it. Listen, men, <laughs> under God... That is the responsibility of the man to make the final decision. And he can't always be right. If it were the other way around, if God had given headship to the woman, she couldn't be right all the time either. But at times like that, somebody needs to be responsible so the, the family isn't paralyzed. Now, I thought back on that. How many times that happened, maybe in our life? And I could maybe come up with one time where we just had to make a decision. We didn't agree. Uh, time was running out. 
and I made the decision. So it's not like that once in 47 plus years of marriage. So whatever that's worth. <laughs> Number three, headship does not mean the husband is always right. It does mean, however, that he is responsible. Because with position comes what? Responsibility. Oh, boy. I'm about to say some things right now that are going to make some men say, I wish God had given it to the woman. <laughs> but he didn't. He gave it to the man, to the husband. The husband is the steward. And listen to me, men. What that means is that one day we will stand before God and Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ and we will hear him say, give an account of your stewardship, of the stewardship in your home. That will happen. And if you remind him of how terribly busy you were on the job, he will listen, look in, peer into your eyes and say, but what about the stewardship of your home? And if you say, but I was really busy at church, we had something every night, he will say, but what about the stewardship of your home? And if you say, I didn't have a very good role model, he will say, but what about the stewardship of your home? And no amount of competence in other areas will even begin to satisfy him in terms of the home. Because along with headship, he made us stewards. And along with stewardship, there is going to be an accounting. And it makes all of us go, oh. <laughs> we're going to give an account. So, right now, 2000, we're almost in 2022. If we've slouched, let's get with it. Because I want that day of standing before Jesus at, at, at the judgment, I want that to be a happy day for you and for all of us. So let's do what God said. The last one, number four, headship is never demanded. Keep in mind that the command God gave, gives to the man and the command God gives to the woman are very different. I won't even tell the names of you men who, when you knew I was going to preach on this subject, and you asked me to stare down at your wife, I won't even tell who your names are. <laughs> because some of you did. <laughs> Ephesians 5.33 However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife, did I emphasize that? Each one of you must, must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Wow. <laughs> Why? Why? Why would he give different commands? Well, it's because the greatest need of man is respect. And the greatest need of woman is love. Or intimacy might be a better, a better word. And if we would all just do our part on love and respect, we'd have one big happy family. So let's do it. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on, women. So the command of the husband is love your wife. That command is never given to the woman. What, you say? I'm not responsible to love my husband? 
Of course you are. But as a woman, you are not required to be the initiator. The husband is. The command to the husband is love your wife. The command to the wife is respect your husband. Wow. Also, the husband is never commanded to make his wife submissive. But, in my judgment, no woman in her right mind would ever resist the leadership of a husband who loves her as Christ loved the church. Wow, let me say that again. In my estimation, no woman in her right mind would ever resist the leadership of a husband who loves her as Christ loved the church. Well, if headship doesn't mean these four things that I just went through, what does it mean? I believe that headship means the husband is to be the pace setter for the family. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ was to his church. Jesus set the pace for his disciples. Jesus set the pace for us. Let me give, before we go to chapter 6, let me give one final word here about lemons. <laughs> you say, what are you talking about? What about those who have had or have a lemon for a spouse? I just didn't know how else to put this, but I feel it needed to be said. My mother was the valedictorian, had a full four-year scholarship to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and instead she got married to a handsome man who had just returned from the war in the, in the U.S. Navy and was becoming an alcoholic. She was basically pregnant or giving birth for the first eight years of her, of her marriage. I was seven years old when the sixth one was born, and I guess there was a, a miscarriage in there someplace. At that time, at that very time on New Year's Eve, my dad, in a drunken brawl, beat a man to death and was sentenced to the state penitentiary. Once he got out, he was on probation and he couldn't touch a drop of alcohol for three years, for three great years. We bought a house, we bought cars, we took vacations. As soon as he got off probation, three years after three years, he started drinking again. He eventually abandoned the family and moved to the West Coast with his father, my grandpa, who had done the same thing to him. As a spouse, I loved my dad, but as a spouse, dad was a lemon. And there are women and there are men in our church who have been hurt badly by a spouse who practiced anything but mutual submission. And Jesus Christ loves those who have been hurt. He loves that hurtful spouse also. And there are no easy answers to this whole thing. But we, we all want our church to be a place of love where judgments are kind and where healing can happen. 
That's what we want in our church. And all I can say is that we fail each other and we fail God, but God never, ever fails us. So if you've had a lemon, you have our love, our, our patience, our consideration. Let's, let's grow together in a loving church. The last guideline is for parents, uh, children and parents. <clears throat> Listen to this command. It's in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. Listen to this command with a great promise. I I won't say too, too many things here because of time, and then we'll be done. Children, oh, I heard that. <laughs> Bless your heart. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, even if your father or mother is a lemon. You're to honor them, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on this earth. I I have leukemia. I never dreamed I'd get to 73 years old. But I I believe it's because I went to my father, apologized to him, and... uh, Ask him to forgive me. And then he did the same thing to me. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life. A whole sermon or a month of sermons could be preached on on these verses. But let me just point out uh, two interesting facts. Number one, the word for children in the Greek is technon, which refers to a child of any age, young or old, in the home or outside of the home, gone from the home. The Greek language had a a word for little children, but that is not the word that is used here. The word refers to a child, really, of any age, and the significance of that is that it refers to all of us because we are all technon, children of somebody. And then it says... Fathers, do not exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of God. Let me also give you another great command with a great promise. Deuteronomy 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will what? Not depart from those ways. So some commands, yes, but some great promises. So in the King James, the word exacerbate, do not exacerbate your children. In the King James, the word was do not provoke your children to anger. Once I said to my son, I remember this like it was yesterday. I could break out into a cold sweat. It's one of my worst memories. He was going someplace that we did not want him to go. This is our middle son who rebelled. And I stood at the top of the stairs and he couldn't get around me. And I said, you're not going to that place. And I became so intent on him obeying me. that that moment could have turned into something physical. Thank God it didn't. Thank God number two son, Brandon, said, okay, I won't go. But I have thought back many times where I almost provoked him to anger. 
I have three boys. Number one son, number three son lives 20 minutes away in Burnsville. Number one son lives 20 minutes away in Excelsior. And number two son lives 20 seconds away in my backyard. Our backyards touch. And it is one of the great joys of my life that he came out of that rebellion Last year, he bought two books on theology, paid for them with his own money, and is studying them, studying them. You know, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Those are promises from God. So, what do you think about mutual submission? What do you think? It's a good idea? Give it a try. Wives, help them. Help the men do that. Men, don't be a dictator. Don't be all those crappy things I preached about. <laughs> be a good husband, a loving husband. And wives, together. Together. Great things for God can be accomplished. Let's stand together. Oh man, what did we sing earlier? You've never failed me yet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that along with these difficult commands that you give us, it would be easy it would be so easy to try and weenie out of all of them. But Lord, along with these difficult commands, God, you give us grace. You, you not only give us grace, you pour it on us. And so Lord, help us to take all the grace and all the commands that you've given us and help us to be faithful to you. And if we've blown it, it's not the end of the world. We can start over again now. And God, I pray that you will bless these, your, your people, your children. I pray that you will bless these men. Help them to be a, 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 the head of a home like Christ was the head of the church. Who loved the church and gave his life for the church. And Lord, help the woman with all of her wisdom and knowledge and, and expertise in areas. Help her to be, as Eve was for Adam, a help meet. Help her to respect that husband and help that husband to love that wife. Lord, when we will very soon one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let that be a happy day for all of these, your people, and for those who had a lemon. Lord, help them to heal. Help us to be understanding. Help us to help them heal. Lord, we love your church. We thank you that you made us a part of your church. Keep your church loving. And I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm not, not actually going out the back door. <laughs>